Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are David Sedford, Executive Director of the Tacoma Museum of Art, or Tacoma Art Museum, Yana Siren, Director of the Albright Knox Art Gallery, and Scott Stulen, President and Director of the Philbrook Museum. Thank you for joining us, panel, and a reminder to our webinar guests that you can ask questions through the Q&A and chat functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll cover those topics during the show or afterwards. So thank you all for coming. It's great to see you. David, uh, Yana, Scott, I know that you are facing so many difficult times in your different museums. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, about those times and how you are continuing to operate. So uh, David, let's start with you. Uh, talk about how you're operating uh, over in Tacoma. Thanks, Mark. Um, well, we're, uh, we're in pretty good shape, um, considering. Uh, we're obviously closed and have been since March 13th. Um, we're all pretty much working from home. A couple of, three people are going in um, most days of the week just to check on things and plant and art. Um, I have to say that the most interesting part of this for me, or one of the most interesting parts, is that our contributed income has, hold up, has held up pretty well. Um, we, um, uh, we've had a couple of... Uh, uh, drives um, and, and it's been doing really well. Our spring luncheon, which is coming up uh, uh, next week, will be our first uh, online uh, uh, luncheon event uh, of any sort. So we're looking forward to seeing how that goes. Um, the, big hit, the big hit's been through earned income, of course. We've lost probably about fifteen to twenty thousand a week from you know front desk, gift, gift store, uh, restaurant, restaurant uh, rentals, and all of that. We got a PPP loan um, uh, in the second round, so all staff who had been uh, on shared time or on standby uh, are currently back at work till at least July 1. Um, and we've been pumping programming out uh, into the community. Um, and interestingly, that I think that has also done incredibly well and is one of the things that we're going to talk about later, I'm sure. But just the views of our e-museum uh, online have, have gone up 400%, allied with some online exhibitions and children's programs and, and things that we've done around the e-museum. But that's something that we're really uh, proud of, but also that we don't think is going to go away in total. So. It's so interesting because you're such the center of the community, and usually you're the center of the community in a physical sense where people yeah. come and visit. But what yeah. you're talking about is sustaining that, that place and Yana, you're doing the same thing. I mean, I saw, I saw with great amusement and I attended uh, the, the great haircut, which I thought was a terrific, terrific um, way to just say, we're all in this together. Uh, could you just, just describe what I'm talking about here? Uh, sure, thank, thank you, Mark. And, and hi, David and Scott, good to see you, uh, dear colleagues. Um, here at the Albright Knox, we are of course, in the same boat as everyone else across the world, struggling with this unprecedented uh, pandemic that sort of uh, arrived on the shores of America uh, fast and furious. Um, insofar as the Albright Knox Art Gallery is concerned, uh, we had a little bit of luck going into this in the sense that uh, we are uh, amidst our largest campus development project ever. And we basically closed down our main campus last November after gradually having downsized our operations by 25%. Right. So basically our entire staff was ready to go remote. Uh, we were not counting on any earned revenue this year or the following year because of our project. So we basically did last year in a pre-COVID uh, milieu what other museums have had to do very fast in reaction to COVID. In our case, it was just because of our $165 million campus development project. Um, we had to shut down construction uh, as per the, the, the Governor Cuomo's executive order, but that uh, shutdown only lasted in our case for about a month. We were able to actually apply for an early start and we are currently pile driving. So if you hear heavy banging, uh, that is from the pile driving uh, just on the construction side over there uh, due north from where I'm sitting. Uh, insofar as our digital platforms, this of course has been something that we've really embraced like 
uh, museums across uh, the country and the world with um, one small piece in this digital array is my, my blog series that I launched in early April. And it was sort of an impromptu thing. I hadn't really planned on it. And I thought that if I'm going to engage the entire team, you know, it's going to suck up a lot of time and people are stressed and overworked anyway. So, you know, I, I just turned my, my camera on, on my, on my desktop computer and thought that I'll, I'll, you know, cut my hair away and sort of think that by, when it has reached that uh, three inch length again, we should be out of this COVID-19 uh, crisis. Who knows? I mean, you know, it's now uh, about half an inch in, in, into growth. So we'll see if my hair will be any estimator of the duration of this uh, precarious situation. But, but it was a great example of, of how you can, as a museum director, make yourself and your museum so accessible. And in Buffalo, the Albright Knox room so large one of the oldest museums in the country, has a fantastic reputation. Uh, and, and now with the build out, it'll be, it'll be terrific. And we have here two coastal museums. And then of course, a museum in the center of the country with your Scott over at the Philbrook, a beautiful facility. Also, a, a, the real beating heart of Tulsa. Uh, talk about how you're operating. Sure. And it's really, you know, the same as everybody else. We're dealing with the same challenges going forward. We, the day that we shut down, we had an exhibition opening that night that we missed. So that exhibition has been sitting by itself um, since. And then last month, we actually had to uh, move our, our main fundraiser, which is a wine event. It's a $3 million event for us, move it to next year. So that causes some cash flow challenges for this year. But as a whole, we're, we're managing. We did have some furloughs. We did get a PPP loan that did be able to bring those staff back, and that will kind of carry us to the middle of June. But we know we're going to have to make some adjustments. We just had our board meeting yesterday about next year's budget. So <laughs> we know it's going to be a challenge going into the next year, but I feel really good. Now, on the positive side, our membership, people have stepped up. The community has stepped up. Our board members have stepped up, and we've been able to hold those contributions really, really yeah. solidly yeah. there. But our earned income, again, has been down. Um, we expect that to hopefully come back here uh, in the latter half of this year, but it will be an ongoing challenge, but some opportunity in that, too. So um, like a lot of museums, so the minute we knew that we were going to go down, we kind of put a team together and say, OK, we're going to have to still continue our mission. How do we do that mission, even though we're going to be more distant from our audience? So we also decided not to be, uh, so we added a whole bunch of programming that went in like others have here too. But I think the other key one I wanted to mention is that we also wanted to be a service to the community. So we've been giving 10% of all of our membership to the COVID relief efforts here through United Way. And we also tripled the size of our vegetable garden. So we have a, big, a huge vegetable garden now. It's our victory garden that's working with the food bank. We've already started to give food through that. You know, I, I'm so glad you mentioned the vegetable garden. Um, you, you and, and Yana both have stunning physical facilities, outdoor facilities as well, right? So you have certain advantages that David doesn't have because uh, your facilities, uh, particularly where you're located, um, the, the museum is fantastic, but you don't have the, the gift of those outdoor facilities. So are you, are you two um, leveraging that in terms of social distancing, it's, it's easier to do it outdoors than, than indoors? So I can speak to me that first, we are, we are currently closed, so that including the gardens are closed, they are in a closed garden. We'll be opening here on June 6th. So we'll be open to members for two weeks and then opening to the public on the 17th of June. Having 23 acres of gardens that we can control is a huge advantage. We know that there's already pent up demand. We already have people that are waiting to get tickets to come into that space. So we're going to lean heavily on that throughout June and then slowly start opening interior space. And I think it's a big advantage that we have that, that we can spread people out and be able to leverage that space as long as we can. Uh, and here in Buffalo, uh, I think we are doing very much the same. As our primary prong in, in this area is our public art work. Uh, we are the only art museum in the United States that has a public art department integrated into the body of the museum. And we basically run public art for city of Buffalo and Erie County. This is uh, an import from Finland, actually. 
uh, and public art is now enabling us to create works in different parts of the community, underserved sections of the community. Uh, we are creating many of these works sort of collaboratively with local artists, in fact, bringing art materials to them. They create works in their studios and then eventually will create public artworks of these collaborative <laughs> joint efforts. Uh, that's really uh, ha has been for the past seven years and, and continues to be a really uh, dominant part of our program in the public art. And David, you don't have the advantage of this outdoor uh, space, so how are you going to handle the reopening um, of the museum in a way that uh, allows your members to uh, first enter, uh, but also to remain safe? Well, that's a very good, uh, very good question, and it's one that we're spending a lot of time on. Like, like other people, we set up, uh, as soon as this started hoving into sight in, uh, in February, we, we, uh, we set up a COVID uh, planning team at the museum, and uh, uh, one of the things we looked at is a sort of adjustable plan for, for reopening. Um, and we're, we're currently in the, our governor's phase three of reopening for Washington State, which means that possibly we couldn't open um, uh, until uh, the end of June or early July uh, in any way. But we, we, we will be bringing, whenever that date is established, we'll be bringing staff back into the museum a couple of weeks before that. Um, and then the first opening date, whatever it will be, will be one or two weeks, especially for members, like uh, I think Scott was saying earlier. Um, and then we'll move into public. And, and we're, writing, um, we're writing protocols right now as museum directors of Washington uh, to hand to the governor about how we can make our places safe, you know, ensuring six feet around people. Uh, no more than, we're not allowed any more than 50 people in one space at any one time um, when, when we do reopen in phase three. So we're, and, and, and highly recommending the use of masks and even temperature checks. Um, of course, cleaning and disinfecting is, is, is going to be a constant thing. So we're ramping up a little bit our cleaning crew. Um, but I think probably very much the same way as, as, as everybody else um, right now. Um, and I'm really looking forward to knowing when we can be open, because this is very strange for somebody who's been living and breathing museums for 35 years. Very strange to be presiding over a museum that is closed and we don't know when it's going to open. <laughs> um, how, how are your, your curators functioning in this, in this time? Uh, so often, curators uh, spend time um, either inwardly directed or directed into the field, and then their work is experienced through the exhibition itself. The interactions with the audiences are through the work that they do, they do on exhibitions. Well, if exhibitions can't be experienced, are the curators finding other ways to interact with your audiences? Are your educators finding different ways of interacting with their constituents? Than, than were previously. Scott, you want to take that first? Sure. So we've deployed uh, not only our curators and educators, but uh, really across our whole team, including some of the horticulturists too, to do work on our digital content. So we've done almost 200 programs since we closed um, in our digital platforms. And that's everything from what you'd expect is like tours of the curators or Q&A that are kind of more traditional to having like, how do you grow your own vegetable garden with our horticulturists? We've done things like that. But we also had like our contemporary curator hosted a night where we did a Netflix watch party and we watched Bob Ross episodes and she basically did a critique <laughs> of them as we went along. So we've done some things that are more playful in that too. But the whole goal is keeping our team engaged, coming up with interesting content and knowing that a lot of our audience, they want to stay engaged with the museum, but they also need just some escape right now and some joy and some ways of kind of getting away from the, some of the other things in their lives. So we've been kind of deploying it in that manner. And Yana? Uh, very much like Scott. Uh, I think that uh, we've launched somewhere between 150, 200 programs on various digital platforms. It's been exciting to see how fast uh, people have been actually able to first learn the technology and then learn the delivery platforms uh, to broad audiences. And in some cases, what we are seeing is that, in fact, our, our, our participation has increased way beyond our region. So we do an annual Art Alive exhibition here on the museum grounds, for example, usually gets about uh, you know, 100 
or so entries. Now there were 1,500 from across the world. And, and so it, it's been interesting to see how we can spread our wings uh, due to these, or thanks to these um, digital platforms and due to COVID-19. I don't think we'll ever go back to the old normal. The new normal is going to be deploying these platforms in new and exciting ways, even when people do come back to our physical spaces. I think that's, that's so true. I've been talking with museum leaders all across the field and the idea of digital and how digital actually functions and for different collections is, is so important. Um, I don't think anybody has cracked the code, frankly. I think that there is going to be a real change in how each of the departments function, how they connect to a digital engagement function within the organization. As a matter of fact, I was just talking with somebody about a digital content officer um, title, and I suggested that instead think about it as digital engagement, because it's not content as much as it's, it's audience engagement. The content creators are still going to be the curators, the educators, and so on. But how, the, how to engage, there is a specific expertise in how to do that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's just going to be an ongoing learning process uh, for, for the teams within museums, as well as for our audiences. But the opportunities are infinite. In terms of your different collections, I know, David, you have a very three-dimensional collection in your glass collection. Um, and then there are other collections with other attributes. Uh, you also, Scott, have a very much, uh, you know, a part of your collection is very three-dimensional. And, and of course, conventional uh, art that is hung on the wall is more two-dimensional. Are these providing uh, specific challenges in terms of, of, uh, of revealing the art of your collections through digital means, uh, given their different attributes? It hasn't, it hasn't actually, um, it hasn't actually uh, arisen yet, but I'm, I'm sure it will. Um, we, had, like I said earlier, our e-museum has had a 400% spike. And, and interestingly, um, to digress for a second, you know, you can, you can find out where those, uh, um, through the analytics, find out where those people were uh, logging in from. Well, there was a group of about 300 that were in Chicago, and we don't know how that happened or where that came from, but uh, an amazing thing. But no, we're going to absolutely, uh, I think one of the things about COVID, as uh, Jana said, is that it's really going to have accelerated what we were, we've all been talking about for the last 10 or 15 years, which is let's, let's really grapple with this online thing um, and this digital thing. And it's really going to push us in, into doing that. And, and I think it will include, to go back to your original question, um, that we'll, we'll, we'll expand our e-museum to have... Um, um, three-dimensional uh, images of, uh, of works of art. Um, just as you can do a, a three-dimensional tour, three-dimensional tour of a museum, you can do a walk around a, a three-dimensional piece. And I think that's something that we've been talking about, how to expand that and get into it. I think you're also I, raising, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, Scott. Just briefly, I, I think there are definitely, is you have to understand what the platform does and it can't do. And there's certain work that presents well there and certain work that doesn't. And for us, it's been focusing on the storytelling. So really focusing on the storytelling and about how, not trying to do too much and kind of have bite-sized chunks of it, not, and not an hour long lecture, but how do you distill it down to five, 10 minutes and think about how your audience is engaging in that. And it is a big experiment. We're all kind of learning this at the same time. And with it, I think the good thing is it's relatively inexpensive. So we can try a whole lot of things, see what works, see what doesn't, and then be able to kind of invest more in the things that work. And, and I would just add one other thing, if I may, um, is that one of the really interesting parts of this is that since our education department has been doing online teaching to schools, because schools, most schools will be out in Washington at least until the new year, it would seem. So they've been teaching um, museum visits, doing museum visits online. Um, but the schools that have been coming to them have been coming from much further afield, which is really interesting. So we're going to have to deal with that and, and, and uh, how, we're going to, how we're going to grow into that as well. I love the combination of points you're making, the whole idea of storytelling, right, which is essentially what we're doing. The objects become the vehicle for telling a story, telling a story about history or telling a story about contemporary life telling a story about what the artist is trying to convey and what the viewer is actually perceiving. It's actually a storytelling experience. And now that we are, are deprived of that physical presence, 
we have to find ways of telling those stories, conveying those stories in different ways. And that's, and that's what we're doing. And also to different audiences, you are located in physical spaces, but what is made clear through David's um, uh, whole uh, um, uh, point is that he's got Chicago viewers now. He's got Chicago visitors and they can do it like that. They don't have to get onto an airplane. And Yana, you know, right, in an international world, you can actually connect with all these different audiences before they physically walk in. And that, Scott, right, in terms of your own engagement, when somebody comes to Tulsa, having them know about the Philbrook before they ever walk in, isn't that a fantastic opportunity for us all? Absolutely. Yana, why don't you, you talk a little bit about your experience, because you, you uh, among all of us, you've, you've lived a life that is uh, multicultural, uh, international in, in, in span. And, and we have in the United States somehow at, at certain times left opportunity on the table, um, which now you can pick up using these mechanisms, right? Uh, very true. I, I think that, you know, as, as you mentioned, I, I'm a bit of a mutt having lived and grown up in, in seven different countries and 14 different cities. And uh, there's a richness to that experience and also a homelessness to it in some way. Uh, but in this digital realm, that type of a homelessness can actually become a great asset because it's all of our home, right? We, we come together, we gather, we, we serve one another, we make new friends. Um, it, it, it's a unique opportunity to, for us to think locally as well as globally at the same time. In serving our communities, we are also serving interests and audiences around the world. And of course, the, when I look at the museums I used to run in, in different parts of, of the Nordic region, um, it's interesting to see how they are tackling this and then compare that to our approach here in the US. And it enables us to, in a sense, uh, I don't wanna ch say cherry pick, but to choose best practices and to learn openly from one another uh, without discriminating, uh, let's say, by nationality or geographic region. We, have a, we don't have to reinvent, reinvent the wheel because in many cases, the wheel has already been reinvented. Now we just have to be intelligent about sort of adjusting and assimilating those best practices. Such a great point. And then there's the whole issue of monetizing these, these interactions because that's part of what a museum does to self-sustain. It's how do you monetize the interactions when it's not a sale of a ticket? You've all talked about the fact that your donors are sustaining your organizations, but your earned revenue has taken a hit. The next stage of this digital engagement is going to be how do you monetize this so that people are providing funding for your ongoing operations in the digital sphere as well as in the physical sphere. Do you have any thoughts about uh, about that aspect? We, we've been looking actually at, at absolutely that over the last couple of weeks. Um, um, and, and in line with our uh, um, uh, normal accessibility protocols for, for the museum, trying to work out which of these programs we can insert a paywall for that are going out. Um, uh, we don't want to do any of that right now because because we just want to make the community feel better. But but at some point, if we're if we're talking to school districts far 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 away from Tacoma, and 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 beaming out to school districts far away from Tacoma, yeah, we're going to want to install a paywall so that they can uh, pay for those programs. And 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 it's it's a really good point and it's a really sensitive point because in the past we've all been doing this uh, free gratis and for nothing. As part of as part of our outreach, but if this really does change the the our world, and I think it will, we're we're absolutely going to have to grapple with 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 digital payment for these digital services. Yana, you were saying you were about to say something. Uh, yes, I I think that what's going to happen in the near term, anyway, is that earned earned income is going to take a hit, but contributed income uh, could rise significantly. We've seen an uptick uh, in our membership contributions, for example, uh, just due to the digital platforms that we've been deploying. I think that there's a notion of, uh, of if you care uh, and if you give, you get. 
uh, I think the one open marker here for the U.S. to think about very carefully is is government contributions, because I think that uh, you know in Europe, of course, governments contribute generously to their cultural organizations, and there's a reason for that because nations exist as markers of identity, as as symbols of who we are as a society. And I think that in the U.S. there isn't as strong a tradition for this, but as we are seeing government intervention step into the realms of the private sector, one could envision perhaps also the possibility that Americans start to think of uh, culture as a civil liberty, something that we have a right to enjoy, all of us. And that would be a signal uh, to government uh, components, whether local or uh, on a federal level, to be a bit more generous towards institutions that give so much uh, to this great nation. Well, I think also, in particular, if you look at look at the uh, tourist dollars that are attached to these experiences, the fact is, is that when people come to Tulsa, uh, where do they visit? Right? They visit the Philbrook. When right. people come to Tacoma, where do they visit? They visit the, the various museums in, in, in uh, Tacoma. And the same thing in Buffalo. I mean, going to Buffalo and not visiting uh, the Albright Knox would be absolutely insane, right? People come to, to come to Buffalo, they go to the Albright Knox and they have a fantastic experience. I know I have every time I've gone to, to, to Buffalo. So, you know, that, that idea of, of having that attachment to so many business drivers within the uh, community is so important. And then you have the educational pieces, uh, all that work in civil society uh, for citizens of, of, of those places. I think there's a real case to be made, uh, but uh, each state is different, right? I mean, you know, Oklahoma is, is a t completely different uh, uh, type of operating environment, isn't it, Scott? It is, <laughs> good and bad sometimes. And I think we all are dealing with you know, different landscapes, different audiences. And I actually, I think one of the next big challenges is gonna be as we reopen, is really bringing our two kind of types of audiences. I know I've got people on staff and also in the community that are not even close to ready to be going out and opening. And I've got people that are basically already there. And it's to bring everybody together in the middle to a place where we're being safe, responsible, but can still function and be open as an institution. And I think that's gonna be the next challenge, both from staff, but also from our audience, is how do we get to that, this next phase, which is this partially open but safe phase that may extend for quite a while. And I think in that, all the digital is gonna still continue. You know, I know we're looking at monetization there, but I also caution on that a little bit. As more places open, there's gonna be less demand on those digital spaces and there's a lot of free content out there. So even seeing it in a restaurant context, curbside won't continue forever because the competition will water down because people can go out to restaurants again. So it's just a kind of how are we going to navigate this in-between space there? And I think that's going to be the next thing. And it's different for Oklahoma than it is for another state. It is. And, and in that difference, right? Viva la différence, right? You, in that difference is, is the rich fabric of the United States. David Sedford of the Tacoma Art Museum, Yana Siren of the Albright Knox in Buffalo, and uh, Scott Stulen of the Philbrook in Tulsa. Thank you all so much for participating. That's the nonprofit report for today. Thank you all uh, attendees for, for coming and visiting with us. And let's get this, this done. Let's reopen the country and let's continue to provide these types of experiences to our audiences.